Sultans. In tonight's episode, we're going to talk about this big pink house and about the Sultans Massacre. This was the biggest murder ever perpetrated in the history of New Orleans. The time is the 1830s. We've just experienced a really deep recession and the entire Southern economy was in collapse. One guy in dire straits, the owner of the building here, he ran an ad in the local uh, Times Picayune newspaper for a whole year, putting that entire building for rent. Well, good luck with that buddy because uh, there is no money in Orleans in those days. He's about to commit suicide about a year into it. When at the last minute he gets saved, when this very flamboyant, mysterious stranger shows up at his doorstep, he asks to see the house. And the owner, believing that this guy was a lunatic, only showed him the living room and just for a few minutes, wanting to get rid of the guy as quickly as possible. He quoted him a price that was about three times what he really had in his mind. By the way, I said uh, flamboyant stranger because this mysterious uh, guy who uh, wanted to see the house had a humongous turban on his head. All these uh, beads, feathers and flowers on that turban, all these silky robes in very, very bright uh, shiny colors with more beads and flowers on them. Even for New Orleans during Mardi Gras, he looked like a lunatic, but it was not even Mardi Gras. So the owner quoted him a price uh, a lot higher than what he really had in his mind, upon which the mysterious stranger very quietly opens his man purse and puts cold hard cash on the table in front of the owner's eyes. What just happened? The owner cannot believe uh, his luck. All this money, not just for the first month, but for the entire lease agreement for five years, all of it in advance. The owner cannot believe his luck. Of course, he allows the guy to move in, but it took the mysterious stranger a whole year to move in. That's because he did not move in alone. He moved in with a contingent of 13 wives, an entire harem, all of them uh, his wives, and nine husbands, all of them his husbands, a second harem. As soon as everybody moved in, course the party started and by parties I mean they would start at about five o'clock in the evening and would only end about seven o'clock or eight o'clock the next morning every single day day after day after day the neighbors started moving out because of all the noise because of all the ruckus here because of all the drunks shuffling out of the house and puking on our sidewalks and by the way not much has changed in New Orleans since then but we're not gonna get into that tonight anyway this uh, area here became sort of uh, semi-deserted and uh, as soon as the new tenant moved in, he started bragging to the entire city, I am the big Turkish Sultan, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. And these parties, uh, at these parties, he would invite all the uh, elites in the city. There were rumors about all the orgies going on day and night in that house. One important thing to mention is that the Sultan also placed about 10 soldiers around the perimeter of his house, standing there 24 seven as guards with big scimitars, swords and shields. So anyone could say he was a little paranoid about his security. Well, these parties went on uninterrupted for close to three years, but three years later it all came to a sudden end when one fine morning at about uh, five o'clock in the morning, one of the neighbors was walking her dog on that sidewalk where the house is. She was coming this way. When she got to the beginning of the block, she realized that there was this eerie unsettling silence. There were no drunks in front of the house. The soldiers were gone. The music was uh, out dead quiet intrigued she continues walking she gets to the front steps by the front steps she realizes that there's this uh, thick gooey blood cascading down those steps she goes very quickly she alerts the cops they get here very very quickly they bust inside the house and inside all three floors they find the same thick gooey blood on every single floor it was like that because that blood had human remains in it. By that, I mean half of a leg here, a quarter of an arm there, severed heads, even eyes taken outside of their orbits, disembodied hearts and livers and kidneys and brains scattered on all the sofas and countertops. It took the cops an entire day just to do a simple head count of the severed heads and they came up with a number of 37. 37 people butchered up into small pieces like this and what we believe it was less than one hour. And I say that 
because the neighbors, the few remaining neighbors that were still uh, in this area here, said that they heard noise and music up until about four o'clock. And this uh, lady, this other neighbor with her dog discovered this scene at about five o'clock. It must have been done during that one hour of silence. Well, the official version from uh, back then and even from today, from everybody, from the cops, from the morgue, from the hospital, from uh, the Times-Picayune newspaper, from the other local newspapers, from the city of New Orleans, from the mayor, from the governor of Louisiana. The official version from everybody has been that this was done by pirates. We did have a lot of piracy back then. We are a port city, so of course, naturally, pirates used to come from the harbor to loot people's homes, to get drunk in our bars. But in this case, it doesn't quite fit their profile. Now, guys, make no mistake, if a pirate came inside your house to loot it in those days here in New Orleans, yes, if you stood in there wait to loot it, of course, they would kill you. But the way they did it was maybe with a sword through your stomach or a bullet through your brains. And once you drop dead, they would take that precious little time to uh, steal as much as possible and get out as quickly as possible. In this case, it doesn't quite fit their profile because also whoever did this did not steal a single thing from the house. This smells to me more like a revenge crime. With a little bit of research, not too much, it was quite easy. We found out a, a few years ago that actually back in those days, the rules of the Royal House of the Ottoman Empire of Turkey dictated there was the male firstborn only who inherited almost everything from the father sultan. All the younger brothers and the sisters got a tiny, tiny symbolic stipend to barely live on. So a lot of us here in New Orleans believe that this was actually a uh, not the actual sultan, the guy who was bragging to be, but maybe this tenant was one of the younger brothers. Maybe he uh, absconded with his brother's wealth, envying it, and then uh, loaded that wealth on a big ship back in Turkey, back in Istanbul, and crossed the ocean over here to uh, New Orleans with it, thinking, you know what, across the ocean in America, my brother will never hear about my whereabouts because it's too far but because of all these crazy wild orgies that were going on here, because of the rumors, at least, rumor must have slowly traveled back all the way to Turkey. And the real Sultan, the uh, older brother, got the coordinates, basically, and came here for his revenge with an even larger army than those uh, 10 soldiers that uh, the fake Sultan placed around uh, his house. It's just an, just an opinion, just, a specul just some speculation here. But uh, the Sultan was found actually in his courtyard. Two days later when they found just the fingertips, just the very top of the fingertips of some person, they dug up this person, it was the Sultan. He had been buried alive in that courtyard. And we know this because he had a lot of dirt in his esophagus and lungs, a sign of being buried alive. 